Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In this video, we will be looking at friction brakes, how the brake force is generated, how the brake force is controlled, how the brake force is applied, and hopefully at the end of the video, we'll have a better understanding of how brakes work. The problem with discussing brake designs is that the most information that is available online, it's either very high level or it's either very abstract. While it definitely does help, it still doesn't provide the finer details and the intricacies of how brakes actually work in a train. But thankfully, the train that you see here in front, which is Vande Bharat, designed and manufactured in India, thankfully, a lot of its information has been made public and I'm going to post the links in the description below. We'll be basically learning by example, looking at the design of this train's brake. Just to get the ball rolling, let's maybe talk about in general how many different types of brakes are there and then from there we'll delve into the specificities of that exact train's design. So what you're seeing in front are disc brakes. You could have disc mounted on the outside of the wheel or on the axle or on the wheel. And there are these brake calipers, which are blocks that press against the disc, which then provides the retardation force. And the energy conversion that happens there is the kinetic energy of the train transforms into heat energy because these blocks become hot. One of the benefits is that this brake does not have any wear and tear on the wheel, but the disadvantages you'll see on the next one. The next one is tread brake. So the concept is same that you have these blocks that are pressing against the wheel to provide the retardation force. The kinetic energy of the train converts into heat energy on this block. But the advantage here is that it cleans the wheel. So any leaves, any grease, any contaminants that are there on the wheel or water that's there on the wheel. It's being regularly cleaned. Because of that, you get better adhesion between the wheel and the rail. The downside is that you have more wear and tear of the wheels. The next one is track brakes. And these are friction track brakes, meaning that these blocks, instead of now pressing against a disc or pressing against the wheel, they are now pressing against the track. So the retardation force is provided through friction between these blocks and the track. One of the disadvantages is that it creates a lot of wear and tear on the track and track is expensive infrastructure. You know, we want minimal damage to the infrastructure. The next one are disc brakes, but these are not friction disc brakes. These are eddy current or electromagnetic disc brakes. So there's electromagnetism at play here, meaning that there are eddy currents produced in the disc, which then provide the opposing retardation force to slow down the train. One of the examples of this eddy current disc brakes are bullet trains in Japan, the Shinkansen, and the benefits are obviously that it's wear free. The energy conversion is again, the kinetic energy is converted into heat energy because disc eventually heats up. The next one are track brakes, but this time it's, it's an electromagnetic track brake, meaning you have eddy currents induced in the rail, which provide the opposing retardation force, which then slows down the train. Same thing, you have a lot of force that is being induced in the rail. So it causes a lot of wear and tear to the infrastructure and we don't want that. The next one is regenerative brakes. So the same motor that is used for propulsion of the train is used for braking the train and the motor now works as a generator. The way a generator works is that you have an external force that is rotating the coil and that rotation creates energy. So in this case, because of the train's momentum, the wheels are rotating and those rotating wheels then rotate the coil inside this generator that then generates the energy. While generating, it also provides retardation force and the energy conversion is the kinetic energy of the train is converted into electrical energy, which then has to be fed back to the main power supply or the catenary. The power supply might not always be receptive, in which case this power then has to be burned somewhere else. And that brings us to the next one, which is rheostatic brake, meaning that power is burned in the resistors. So these are different types of brakes. I'm sure there are more, but the basic ones are the ones that are on the screen in front. Now the brakes that One Day Bharat uses are these disc brake, regenerative brake, and rheostatic brake. And for today's discussion, we'll be only talking about disc brakes. Let's look at how the brake demand that is generated by the driver finally reach all of the wheels of the train. So on a high level, the way that works is the demand that is generated by driver in the form of electrical signal then goes to BCU, which is brake control unit. There is then pneumatic force or air pressure that is then 
transmitted to the brake calipers, and those brake calipers then press against the disc, which then slows down the train. Now, that is a high-level architecture. In some trains, this signal that is transmitted could be a pneumatic signal instead of an electrical signal. The obvious disadvantages are the pneumatic signal takes a lot of time to travel, so in longer train, transmission time could be significant. The other thing is you have pneumatic pressure being applied on the brake calipers. Instead of pneumatic, you could also have hydraulics, so some systems have. Instead of air, you have oil similar to your cars, so you have brake oil that is then generating the pressure to then apply against the brake calipers. So this is the overall architecture, but let's move on. In our example, when driver uses the master controller to generate a demand. In this case, let's say it's 40% braking. One thing that now needs to happen is that demand needs to now reach all of the brake control units that are along the train. And if the train is, let's say, a 16-car train, you could have up to 32 brake control units. So that has to reach all of the brake control units. What will brake control unit do with that information? What it does is that it interfaces with an electro-pneumatic panel, which is called EP panel. It interfaces with the EP panel. This EP panel is able to manipulate the pressure that is then applied to all of the wheels. The big question is how does this command get to the brake control unit? So for that, we have something called TCMS, which stands for Train Control and Management System. So as you can see, there are lots of different control systems on the train. So something like an MCU, which stands for motor control unit, PCU, propulsion control unit, and PCU, brake control unit, just to name a few. And there are all these distributed systems across the train that need to talk to each other. For example, brake control unit needs to tell central computer whether the brakes are working or whether the brakes are isolated. Motor control unit needs to tell the brake control unit whether the regenerative brakes are working or not. Just to name a few examples, but a lot of these systems need to talk to each other for different purposes. So for that reason, TCMS is also called the brain of the train and has a very central role in coordinating different control and monitoring systems of the train. There's complex networking. The switches are routing the packet to all of the brake control units. So that's how the brake control units are given the demand. So now at this point, all of the brake control units are aware that, okay, I need to apply a 40% brake. So what happens next is that this EP panel, which is part of a bigger circuit, then does some control based on that control, the appropriate air pressure then passes on to the brake calipers and the wheels. So now let's look at this pneumatic circuit. Now this pneumatic circuit might look very complicated and daunting in the beginning, but at the end of the day, it's just a circuit where all of the symbols are quite easy to understand. If you were to go online, you will be able to see what all of these symbols mean. But in the essence, pneumatic circuit just consists of these pipes that connect different components to each other. Then there are these transducers or sensors, which you can use to check the pressure. Then there are different types of valves, and you can see how all of these valves are here. Essentially, these are different types of valves connecting the circuit together, achieving the desired outcome. You have compressors, you have dryers, you have reservoirs, all of which we will be looking at. I like to divide this circuit into three parts. I call the first stage as brake force generation. This is where the pressurized air is created. You cannot use the force as it is. You need to make sure that the force that is finally applied is as per what's demanded or as per what's requested. So the next stage I like to call brake force control. And the last phase is brake force application is finally when you have the appropriate brake force that that is then applied to the wheels. And we'll look at all three. So the first stage, brake force generation. What happens with brake force generation? The very first step is the compressor. What compressor does is that it takes in atmospheric air and then pushes out compressed air. So from here, it's taking in atmospheric air, the air that's abundantly available, and then it's sending uh, compressed air on the other side. The way compressor works is, uh, this is a piston compressor. The way it works is that it takes in atm atmospheric air, and then it compresses it and when it reaches a certain pressure this valve opens and the air then goes onto the outlet so now on the inlet there's atmospheric air and on the outlet there is 
compressed air. At the end of this first stage, you now have compressed air in the pipe. There is one problem with compressed air, that there's a lot of humidity in it. The problem with humidities are corrosion. It can corrode wherever it's in contact with the metal. It can plug the lines if the water coagulates and starts settling down. And then all of the design assumes that there will be dry air. So if the air is humid and if it's wet, then the characteristics deviate from what it's designed for. So there is deviation and we don't want that. So that's why we would dry out the air. One of the problems is that it causes growth of microorganisms like mold. I'm sure you have seen that happen in your kitchen or bathrooms, wherever there is more water. So for that, what we do is we dry out the air and we use this thing called air dryer. Now it's a specific type of air dryer. This is called twin tower desiccant pipe air dryer. Now what desiccant means is that it's a material that absorbs moisture like silicon. And the way these dryers work is that you have air coming in from the inlet, the compressed air that we see here. It then goes through all of the desiccant which absorb moisture and then you have these coils that are heated that so goes through the heated coils and then goes through the outlet. So now that's dry air. The reason why we have twin, twin towers is that after a while this becomes wet and then it switches on to the other side. So on the other side then this desiccant and this works while the coil is drying out this desiccant. So now at the end of this stage we have dry compressed air in the pipe. Another thing that we need after dry compressed air is a reservoir. We need a reservoir for the same reason you have a water tank in your house. The reason why you have water tank in your house is that you have all of these houses that need water but the pump might not be able to meet the demand at all times. So for high demand times, you have the tank water that is being used. And for the low demand times, the pump is filling up the reservoir. So that way is the pump and reservoir together are able to meet the demand of all of the houses. And the same concept happens here that the reservoir is full of compressed air and reservoir and pump together are able to meet the demand. So at the end of this stage, what we have is a pipe that is filled with pressurized dry air. And the problem is that the pressure could be anywhere from eight to 10 kilos. It could be different for different designs, but it is the peak pressure that you need to apply to the brake calipers. But that air pressure cannot be used as it is all the time. The amount of pressure that you'll be finally applying to the brake cylinders will depend on how much demand is being requested by the train operator. It's like your car. You do not always go for the most hard braking. Sometimes you go for a soft brake, slowly bringing the car to a stop. Let's look at that part next. So the pressurized air now reaches the ET panel, which is where all of the pressure adjustments will be done. Now, if you remember from the TCMS slide, the ET panel constantly interfaces with BCU, brake control unit, which is more electrical and this is pneumatic. So this brake control unit is receiving the brake demand from the driver and that brake control unit will then control the pneumatic panel such that the output pressure is the pressure corresponding to a 40% braking demand. So the pressurized air then reaches the EP panel where the exact pressure control will be done. This pressurized air is then fed into these two valves. These two valves are where the brake force will be actually manipulated. One is a charging valve that will increase the pressure downstream and the other one is a venting valve that will reduce the pressure downstream. And these two work together in conjunction to achieve the desired pressure that we want downstream. You can see there is also a transducer which will feed back. Basically, it will be telling back what the downstream pressure is to make sure that the demanded pressure is achieved. And that makes it a closed loop system. You'll also notice in general that there are transducers everywhere. And one of their main functions is to do fault detection. So that way you can tell if there's a fault or not and where the fault is exactly. So now that is still not the final pressure that will be sent to the view. There is another component to it. And that component is the pressure coming from the air springs. This is a differential wall that is using the pressure that we demanded and pressure coming from the air springs. Now, why do you need this pressure? Let's look at this illustration. So if your train was unevenly loaded, such that you have 10,000 kilos on this wheel and 20,000 kilos on that wheel. And if there was no load compensation going on, then what would happen is that you will end up applying the same force to both the wheels. When you apply same force to both the wheels, 
your deceleration is going to be s divided by 10,000 here, f divided by 20,000 here. That means that one wheel will be decelerating faster than the other wheel. So what actually ends up happening is that one view ends up taking most of the retardation force compared to the other view. If somehow we knew that the weight here was a lot more, so if somehow we could increase the force proportionally such that now the deceleration on both the wheels is constant, then that would make the matter a lot easier. It would make the retardation force even on both the wheels. So for that reason, we take air spring pressure, so the pressure on the air spring, which is proportional to the load on that bogey, we use that pressure, feed it into this differential valve, and together this pressure and this pressure together then determine how much pressure goes onto the final relay. And whatever pressure goes onto the final relay then determines how much of the main reservoir pressure goes downstream. So now you have pressure coming down to the last phase where the brake force application happens. Now what happens here is that now you have brake force. The brake force then, then goes to these two components. And what these two components are, are part of wheel slip protection system. What wheel slip protection does is that if you end up applying too much force to the wheel such that your wheel locks up, then these will went out some air so that the pressure can be reduced and your wheels can be freed. The pressure then passes through these wheel slip protection valves and then goes to the brake cylinders and when it reaches the brake cylinders that's when it applies the force against brake calipers. So wheel slip protection is a bit more sophisticated and complicated. So what happens is that there is a specific point of slip at which you get the most adhesion. So if your wheels slip more than that, you lose adhesion. If your wheels slip less than that, you lose adhesion. And what these valves are constantly trying to achieve is to keep your wheels somewhere close to that point of slip ratio. So at the end of this stage, you're finally all of the pressure that comes here reaches the brake calipers and the way it reaches brake calipers is that it applies against the brake cylinder and this is of the form of a fulcrum so when it reaches the brake cylinder this part expands and since this is the fulcrum when this expands this will try to go closer together so this will contract and press against the discs that are mounted on the wheel so that's how the brake demand that is generated from the driver handle reaches the brakes. I hope this has been helpful and um, see you in the next one.